Okay, I have 5.30, so we're going to get started. Uh, welcome everyone that's joining us either on the webinar or on the live stream. My name is Jenny Caputo. I'm the Executive Director for Communications and Community Relations, and we're so happy to be able to provide this opportunity for you to interact with us and to be able to provide some information for you. This is our second virtual town hall, and this one it will be focusing on our virtual learning platform as well as student support services and how we'll be delivering those virtually for at least the first three weeks of school. Um, and so we just want to let you know our, our panelists come from uh, a variety of, of areas of expertise throughout our district. So we're here to answer your questions. Um, what we'll do is have a presentation that will hopefully uh, provide a lot of information that you might be looking for. And those presentations will also be posted on our website as well as a video of this uh, virtual town hall once we're done. And if you'll use the Q&A uh, function that you'll see there at the bottom of your screen to ask questions once our once our uh, presentation is over, we'll go through those. We probably won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll try to get to as many as possible. What we found um, Monday night is that a lot of them are similar. So sometimes I will group them and we'll make sure that we get them answered. And for ones that we can't get to, we are um, recording all of those and we're gonna use those to inform our FAQ and future virtual town halls as well. So thanks again for joining us. And for now, I'm gonna turn it over to our superintendent, Dr. Flores, to welcome us all. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you to your team for a wonderful job and for getting this uh, uh, live webinar all hooked up, ready to go. So thank you so much for that. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us. I am Steve Flores, the proud superintendent of Round Rock ISD. We're glad you're joining us, whether you're on the webinar or watching the live stream or even a recorded version of this event for later. Our purpose with these town halls is to bring you our subject matter experts who have been working day in and day out for months to plan a safe reopening of schools for our students and staff and to answer your question and address your concerns. As you all know by now, we will be beginning the school year as scheduled on August the 20th, but we will be 100% virtual for at least the first three weeks. We are very hopeful we will be able to welcome students back to campuses after that, shortly after that, but we also will continue to offer a virtual option throughout the year. Today's town hall will focus on what the virtual platform will look like. As you all know, in March, we had to quickly transition to a virtual learning in a matter of days. That's not the case now. We've been planning through the spring and summer and we'll be able to offer high quality, rigorous, engaging virtual experience for your child. So tonight we'll be providing more information on what that experience will be. We have two more town halls scheduled for next week and hope you'll tune into those as well. On Tuesday, we will have a general overview session of what on-campus learning will look like at the elementary level, and on Thursday, at the middle and high school level. Thank you again for your patience and support as we navigate through these unprecedented circumstances. Please know that in everything we do, the health, safety, and well-being of our students and staff is our top priority. With that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Mandy Estes, Round Rock ISD's Chief of Teaching and Learning, to get us started this evening. Again, thanks for joining us. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Mandy Estes, and it's truly an honor to be speaking with you tonight. And I'm not seeing any slides yet, so I want to give our folks a chance to catch up. Perfect, thank you so much for that. So thank you for joining us tonight for the town hall. Our topic, as Dr. Flores said, is virtual learning. And in tonight's presentation, we hope to provide you with a better idea of what that may look like should you choose that as an option for your child. Next slide, please. And I wanna start here um, with something that a colleague shared with me that I, I, I found very appropriate for the situation that we find ourselves in. Walt Disney was actually never interested in what we did in the past. He was always looking forward, always looking to the future, dreaming of the next great thing and thinking about how to innovate and make his theme parks even better than they were before. And at Disney now, there are groups of individuals who are called Imagineers. And these are the people who are the creative magic behind the parks and resorts and all the products that Walt Disney creates. Imagineering in their corporation is seen as the blend of creative imagination and technical know-how. And in fact, at this moment in public education, we ourselves are imagineering. And thus, we're looking at our systems and reimagining how we might blend high quality instructional practices 
with new technical aspects and to create something that was even better than before for our students and our families. We know the time of COVID-19 was something that none of us wanted. We know it's scary for families, it's unsettling for our, our children. But we also believe truly that this is an opportunity to reshape public education and to do so in a way that's even better than before. And I hope that you will join us on this journey and we so appreciate you for trusting us with your child. Next slide. So tonight uh, we are going to focus on the virtual at-home learning choice. Um, and just to share with you a few important dates uh, as we move towards reopening our schools. Today on July 22nd, we are launching our parent choice survey. And this is a survey, as you know, in which you will be asked to commit to either an on-campus or an at-home learning experience. We ask if at all possible that these are returned by August 6th and certainly as soon as your family is ready to make a commitment to the choice that you, you prefer for your child. From August the 20th through September 9th, all of our students will learn virtually from home. And then on September 10th, students will have the option to return physically on campus or to continue to learn from home. Next slide. So I wanna start this presentation highlighting a little bit about our virtual learning program and know that we'll dive into uh, the, the schedules and the day-to-day -day experience later this evening. Virtual learning in the fall of 2020 will look very different from the experience that our students had in the spring of 2020. The virtual learning that we launched in the spring was a response to a crisis and to an immediate closure. Since that time, we've been preparing for virtual learning in the fall of 2020 in a way that is much improved. Over the summer, we had an opportunity to refine our processes because we used a virtual instructional program in our summer school. And that program featured daily live interactions with teachers and students and the successes that we had there, we hope to replicate and build upon. Also to ensure that our, our teachers are confident and ready to deliver virtual instruction, we developed a virtual teacher academy that will provide training and support so that our teachers are confident and can launch those virtual classrooms in a very high quality way. And then finally, we have acquired a learning management system. You may recall that last spring, we relied upon Google Classroom, which in face-to-face -face settings is very adequate and works very well. However, when you go into a virtual environment, Google Classroom is not as strong as a true learning management system. And so you'll hear a little bit more later this evening about Schoology, which is the learning management we, system we adopted to help our students and teachers collaborate and communicate with each other and to give our parents much better insight into the students program. So our virtual learning program will be facilitated by Round Rock ISD teachers. It will be engaged engaging and rigorous and aligned with on-campus instruction. Lessons will be planned by teachers and teacher teams. We'll follow those consistent Monday through Friday schedules and routines that you're very accustomed to. It will feature daily live interaction with certified teachers in Round Rock ISD coupled with periods of self-paced independent learning. And as I mentioned before, access to all of the resources, the textbooks, the assignments, uh, instructional assessments will be housed within the Schoology Learning Management System. And your students will have opportunities to communicate and collaborate with other Round Rock ISD students. Next slide. Some have asked, what can I do as a parent or caregiver to support my child? Well, first, I want you all to know, we don't expect you to be the teacher. We do ask that as a partner, in this learning experience for your child, that you establish a quiet designated workspace, that you support and encourage your child. I like to call our parents learning coaches for that reason. That you ensure that your student logs in each day and participates in the class. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that will look like later tonight. And that you monitor that your student is completing assignments and coursework just as you would in an on-campus environment and most importantly, that you maintain those direct lines of communication with the, the teacher. That could be by phone, by email, any way that works, but we want you to stay connected with your teacher. 
I also want to share with you that your child will have full access to the instructional resources that we provide on campus. Those will be provided within the Schoology platform. So you'll see text, you'll see um, the textbooks, you'll see assignments, you'll see videos, all within that one-stop shop. We're also developing a curbside pickup protocol that will allow our at-home learners to check out books from our campuses without having to enter the campus. If needed, we'll provide your child with devices or hotspots. We ask for safety purposes that if your child has a device at home that they're able to use, that they do so. And we'll assist you with that onboarding process to make sure that your device is all set up and ready to go. And for our high school CTE students, we will allow them to access the high school to complete required activities to obtain CTE certifications. So those courses like auto tech um, or uh, uh, the culinary where they need to do demonstration lessons, your child will be able to come to the campus to complete those activities. Next slide. A lot of questions have come to us about attendance and we do have guidance from TEA on that and as of today, students who are learning at home may be counted present for attendance purposes under one of three conditions. Either demonstrating daily progress within the Schoology system or daily interaction with the teacher or completing and turning in assignments. The important thing to note on all of this is that your child will be required to attend school daily Monday through Friday. I've had a couple of questions from parents um, asking if their child could kind of binge through all of the work on Monday or Tuesday and then take the rest of the week off and for attendance accounting purposes your child will need to be present and involved in school each day. Next slide. And at this time I'm going to turn it over to Margot Vogelpool who is our director of Title I in Pre-K. And at this point in the presentation, we're gonna walk you through what a day in the life of an at-home virtual learner will look like um, by grade level. And so we're gonna start with Pre-K. Margo, take it away. Thank you, Mandy. Good evening, everyone. Well, I am providing you some information regarding the Mighty Class of 2034. So just to give you a little information about our incoming uh, four-year-olds, I wanna let you know a little bit about what you can expect in a virtual learning environment. First and foremost, we'll continue to schedule our students into homeroom classes of 22 students with both a teacher and an educational assistant. Both teaching partners will be there to serve your students' needs and to ensure that we build strong, positive relationships with our students. The other is that students will continue to engage in a blend of scheduled live uh, teaching as well as virtual teaching. So live being synchronous and of course our asynchronous, which is uh, more flexible and can be adapted to what the schedule that's best for you and your family. During the asynchronous time, children will be able to do some of their guided practice. So after meeting with us live and virtually with their pre-K teacher, they'll be able to practice some of the skills and uh, concepts that have been taught by the teacher. Families will be offered also flexibility and choice in determining their schedule during asynchronous learning time. So we will be able to provide lessons um, and a menu, a, a menu of options to families so that you can pick and choose the best time to do that. As Mandy mentioned, you know, there might be periods of time where you're able to do a few more lessons than another period of time during the day. But we will have plenty of lessons for your child to do and a variety of those so that they best meet a child's needs. In addition to that, students are going to be provided the opportunity for individual and small group um, throughout the day, every single day. So we will be meeting with our students live twice daily, but that's not the only time that they'll have the opportunity to speak to their teacher. Our main goal is to ensure that as children are welcomed into our school system and into our school district, that they feel loved and nurtured and that all of their needs are met. In addition to that, we're gonna be providing academic lessons. The academic lessons will not only include core content areas like language arts, math, science, and social studies, but in addition, also integrate social and emotional learning, art, music, physical education, and technology integration. In addition, on our campuses that are 
an arts immigration academy. We will also have lessons for dance and theater. Throughout the day, um, next slide please. Thank you. Um, I, I'll be showing a sample uh, pre-kindergarten schedule. And it's important to keep in mind that this schedule is a sample. It does meet all of the domains that are set by the Texas Education Agency, as well as the pre-K components that we've identified in Round Rock ISD as being of high quality and necessary for all of our four-year-olds. You'll notice as you look through this schedule that there are two periods of time where we are meeting live with students. And the rest of the day is asynchronous where children will be able to do some guided practice. However, throughout the day, children will still have the opportunity to meet with their teachers. In addition to that, I think it's important to know that this is a sample. And so please be aware that we are continuing to get feedback and guidance from the state, our district, and of course, all of our stakeholders. And that will impact some, of, some decisions that may be up and coming. I wanna leave you with this before I pass it on to elementary uh, for them to share their, uh, their virtual learning plan. Please be aware that our pre-K teachers are excited and cannot wait to welcome our students. This will be their first time in school, and I want you to reassure you as parents and as families that we will be ready for them and can't wait to meet that class of 2034. So now I'll pass it on to elementary. Hey everyone, it's great to see you tonight, even in this virtual environment. Uh, my name is Carla Amaker. I am Area Superintendent for the Round Rock Learning Community um, and have been working with our elementary schools for several years in Round Rock ISD. Uh, we've been working together with a fantastic group of elementary principals and um, have learned a lot, as Ms. Estes said, from our summer learning program for elementary school. We had um, about 300 kids um, participate in summer learning in elementary school, and they were in a synchronous environment. Um, and we had teachers who were given a lot of autonomy to figure out what works in that environment. And so we have just uh, some fabulous lessons learned and are really excited about moving into this area in the fall. And um, I just want to talk a little bit about um, some of the components of what the virtual learning model will look like um, in the fall. It will be a blend, much like pre-K. Um, the synchronous portion will be an hour of whole group time every day with our classroom and one hour of a small group lesson every day. Um, and so that whole group time is really important um, to build some community within the classroom, even virtually. Um, we had some teachers this summer say that they really were able to develop relationships with their kids in that virtual environment. So we think that's very important for kids to feel like they are loved and cared for and a part of the classroom community. So that time is important and it might seem like that um, social emotional piece is something that maybe you don't have to get up at 8.34 in the morning, um, but really we need you to. Um, we need the kids to be present because it is more than just um, conversational. Uh, we are going to be relating a lot of that dialogue to our Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills that are focused in on communication, listening, and speaking. Um, it's an opportunity to do some preloading of vocabulary development and to really set the stage for the day and walk through what some of the asynchronous learning and what that will be on their own will look like and some of the expectations from the classroom teacher. So uh, missing that part of the day would really uh, not be advantageous for a kiddo. So that hour time um, starts with that classroom meeting in which all those things I just described happen. Um, there's some flexibility for families because we know there's just a lot going on in this world of COVID right now. And uh, we really need the kids to be with us during their scheduled live sessions. Um, and then the asynchronous part, we're going to provide a schedule. The one I'm providing with you tonight is a sample, um, but your child will get a schedule that you can hold them to at home. Um, or if your family needs to take those asynchronous times and flex those into the evening when maybe an older sibling or another relative or friend um, might be more available to support, that's okay. The asynchronous has some flexibility, um, but we're also providing a schedule for you. So um, really want to meet the needs of our families who are dealing with different scheduling challenges. The day will begin and end um, with uh, students having the opportunity to pop into a virtual support room. Um, it may not be with their own classroom teacher, but it will be with a grade level teacher or expert who is very aware of the assignments that are out there right now for the asynchronous learning. 
So if they have questions, if they were working the night before, they know that they can get up in the morning and pop into that virtual support room and get their questions answered um, by an adult who really will know how to navigate that learning for them. Um, and then the schedule does include um, our specials, art, music, and PE as well. So if we could move forward to the sample schedule. So as I mentioned, the day is bookend. Um, that is really small. If you're like me, you're not really seeing that, but um, I'll talk you through it just a little bit. Um, the day is bookend by those virtual learning support rooms, and the, the time of the day is the exact same time of the physical school day. So we're still meeting all the required minutes set forth to us by the state. Um, so at 740, those virtual support rooms will open. Um, kids can pop into them if they need assistance. Otherwise, they can use that opportunity to be working on some of their asynchronous learning tasks. Um, in this sample, uh, the 8.30 to 9 o'clock time is that class meeting where a lot of the setting the day, setting the tone um, for the day takes place, sets the stage for what's going to happen that day. Um, from 9 to 9.30 in this schedule, um, our uh, primary students in grades K, 1, and 2 uh, will engage in an interactive read aloud or an interactive writing lesson um and you know just set the literacy um, expectations as well so um, that's a really important part of the day in grades three through five that's an opportunity for the teachers to either provide a mini lesson uh, for science and social studies or to set the stage for whatever projects of inquiry are going on in those subjects right now um, so that's an important part of the day as well um, there's a little bit of a break and then the meat of the rest of the day, your child will be assigned to um, one small group and the day will be chunked into their um, synchronous live small group time with their teacher. And then two other times in which they'll focus on literacy in the asynchronous time. And then another um, chunk of time where they're focused on um, math in their asynchronous time. So in the asynchronous lessons, um, you know, that are coming to them for them to do on their own, we're thinking about that as more of the direct instruction. That is maybe a, you know, for example, and maybe a 20 minute um, video that the teaching team has put out to teach a concept, um, along with the activities and lessons for the kids to engage with, practice with, and um, um, interact with the content just a little bit more. So that's the, the more um, direct teach to all aspect. When I, as a teacher, get my small group with me live, then I can go into the math and literacy concepts more differentiated towards the students' individual needs. Um, there's lots of ways for us to um, work with those small groups, and we have lots of materials available to us. Um, one thing that we found very advantageous in the summer learning months um, was the utilization of educational software. Um, so not only will kids be getting feedback from their classroom teacher, uh, they will also be engaging with software that gives them feedback as well. Um, for reading, we have um, a benchmark education system, which we have been utilizing um, for the last year in our district. And so our teachers and kids are already pretty familiar with that. And some of our teachers have used iStation, um, and then some will be introduced to that um, this fall. And that's an opportunity for us to um, assess kids um, with the reading program, as well as assign practice text for them to read and respond to. Um, in math, um, some of our learners are familiar with Dreambox. It has not been a platform that's gone across all of our elementary schools yet, um, but this fall, that's what we'll be doing. And Dreambox as well gives great feedback back to the teacher on the concepts that kids are mastering or not mastering. So when I, as a teacher, get my small group with me, I can look at my group of learners and know who's struggling with what um, through their Dreambox lessons and make sure that I'm going back and uh, filling in some of those gaps and helping them master that content. So there's really three chunks of the day um, when it, I've got my small group time and then an asynchronous chunk for math and an asynchronous chunk for literacy. Um, at the end of the day, there's another opportunity for me to um, go back and ask clarifications of somebody in that virtual support room. So that simple um, schedule is out there for you to look at. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not sure what version this is. We've had a few, um, but we continue to refine it through conversations with our teachers and our principals. Um, and by the time that we launch, we're going to be having such a product to be very, very proud of and that your kids are going to benefit from.
I think I'm passing it on to secondary. Thank you, Carla. I'm Nancy Guerrero. I'm the area superintendent for the Cedar Ridge Learning Community, and I'm excited to be here this evening with you to share some of the highlights in relation to secondary virtual learning. Um, we have been working hard and collaboratively with the teaching and learning um, community, our principals. We've learned a great deal, as uh, Ms. Amaker mentioned, for, from our student from our summer learning experience. Um, and so um, let me share with you um, some of what we are already planning. What we will deliver virtually will be a blended platform with real-time interaction between teachers and students and independent practice, both at the middle school and high school level. Students will participate in academic and elective courses in both the middle school and high school um, environments. We very much are committed to ensuring that our students are getting all of the courses in which they have um, registered to participate in. At the middle school level, specifically, students will have their academic elective courses and also advisory time. In that advisory time, we will, provi we will be providing social and emotional learning learning support and office hours so that students can have more one-on-one -on -one time or a response to any um, challenges they may be encountering with the curriculum. We are again committed to that live synchronous instruction with our teachers. Our teachers are excited to be able to provide that level of instruction. During that synchronous time, it is scheduled and I will be sharing a middle school and high school sample schedule for you. At the middle school level, we have decided to take that seven day, seven period or eight period schedule and create an AB schedule where students will have an opportunity to it explore and participate in four classes per day, 30 minutes or two hours, 30 minutes per period um, of synchronous time, real time with their fellow students and our teachers, and then 60 minutes where they can work asynchronously, independently on their assignments. So again, it's four periods on an A day, four periods on a B day, which encompass seven academic and elective courses, and then an advisory period. For the high school, we already have an adopted AB schedule. And so for our synchronous time at the high school level, we will commit one hour to each period synchronously and then have an additional 30 minutes for each course that's asynchronous. If we could, um, the asynchronous learning experience is more flexible, so we will provide you with a schedule to follow for each of the periods, but you also have that level of, fe of flexibility so that you can prioritize as needed. The important piece also through all of this experience is that we will be providing student support throughout the day, each day, um, Monday through Friday, dependent on what our students may need. If we can go to the next slide, we can explore that schedule specifically. Let's begin with the middle school. And while we're pulling that up, Dr. Guerrero, I do want to clarify because I don't want us to be guilty of, of speaking an uh, educational language that others don't understand. Synchronous simply means, and you see, see it here on your screen, that the students and teachers are engaged at the same time online. Whereas asynchronous would be that independent study, um, perhaps student to student collaboration, pre-assigned work, self-paced work um, that the student uh, completes on their own time. So thank you Absolutely. for allowing me to interject. Thank you, Ms. Estes, and, the, and that was the um, reference to the schedule. So if we begin by looking at the middle school schedule. You can see that that first period or fifth period on a Tuesday, for example, we would begin our day at 820 as our middle schools do with that first period direct instruction teacher guided practice where students are engaging virtually and live. 
Thereafter, after the 30 minutes of direct instruction, we would come off of that live whole class experience and have an opportunity for, as Mrs. Estes explained, asynchronous. This does not mean that the child is moving on and working completely independent. We would explore opportunities to have small group discussions, um, small group direct practice, or independent practice, depending on the student's needs. So things can be individualized for each of the courses, academic and elective. I do want to again highlight that um, at the middle school level, all of our principals are highly committed to the social emotional learning of our students and, and thus have incorporated advisory time within our schedule so that we may explore and provide lessons, opportunities to dialogue, um, and also continue to provide learning support. And in fact, also provide some office hours beyond um, what we are doing with the direct instructional piece. So this is an example of you continue to go through where you see 30 minutes of direct instruction per the four courses one day, and then um, 30 minutes per course, which is a total of two hours of direct instruction, synchronous or live interaction with your teacher and student for the middle school. If we can transition to the high school piece, the sample schedule is, um, we'll give it a moment to come off of this sample and jump into the second link back in the presentation for a high school schedule. The difference with the high school is the direct instruction or synchronous live teach that is happening for each period is one hour per course each day. And again, it will recall the high school schedule is already on an AB schedule. Middle school is typically on a 50 minute per 50 minute schedule per course. And so we typically run a schedule of first period through eighth period each day and we're splitting it up to an AB schedule with middle school. High school, again, is going to um, remain AB with one hour of direct instruction. And so if you explore the sample schedule here, you'll see the one hour for first period and then on a B day fifth period with 30 minutes of independent study labs and small group collaboration. Schoology that we'll be presenting here shortly does have a feature where we can break into our small group um, sections or classes, so to speak, virtually. So um, again, we're very excited about the possibilities. You heard Ms. Amaker say that things continue to change. We are busy working and meeting with our principals and teacher teams to ensure that we have the best product for you when we welcome all of our students back on August 20th. At this point, I think I'm turning it over to Dr. Ali, is that correct? I think you're turning it over to uh, to me, Dr. Guerrero. But uh, uh, yes, Dr. sir, Ali Mr. Will Smith. Definitely be there to answer some questions uh, with us as well. But uh, thank you, Dr. Guerrero. Uh, my name is Ryan Smith. It's my pleasure tonight to share um, some of the features of Schoology. Um, I'm excited to to share this with you both as a as an educator, but also as a parent. I'm in the district. I've got um, two sons who'll be in our schools next year, and I'm I'm uh, really looking forward to the way that this is going to help me as well keep up with with uh, their instruction. But um, just want to give some highlights tonight. Also going to share some ways that um, you as parents and students are going to be able to get some training and learn some more about Schoology before the school year starts. But really just as an overview, um, as everybody's been saying tonight, Schoology is a full-blown learning management system. So really what that um, entails is almost everything that a student needs and engages with is going to be incorporated into this, this, one, this one product. Um, so a lot of the ways they have to sign, in the past, they've had to sign on to multiple different um, resources. This is going to help um, streamline a lot of that work. Um, so the way teachers are going to be using Schoology, sort of similar to how um, you saw Google Classroom being used by teachers last year, but with a lot more features and a lot more of a, a lens into the classroom for parents. Um, it also provides a safe uh, forum for students to be able to interact with each other and with their parents. And then it's also going to, to serve the need of that um, ability to turn in work, assign work, everything like that. 
And as far as students, um, you really think of this as kind of the student's backpack or locker um, or folder system that they would have um, in, a, in a more traditional face-to-face -face setting. A lot of that's gonna be incorporated into their Schoology account. And then as a parent, you're gonna have a, a clear lens into all your child's classes, upcoming and previous assignments. Um, the grade book's gonna be incorporated within Schoology. Um, so I think you'll be able to see a lot more um, information around um, grades and assignments. And then as well, um, teachers will be able to use Schoology to make class announcements um, as a communication tool as well um, with, with parents and with students in the class. And, and likewise, um, I know in the past we've used Home Access Center. Um, so this will be incorporating what we used Home Access Center for in the past. And there'll also be that notification piece where you can customize how you want to be notified either through email or push notifications um, through the Schoology app to better keep up with your, your, uh, your students' Um, assignments and their, their daily work. Um, but uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, just to give a couple highlights um, and then essentially invite you to be on the lookout for more information. But uh, coming in mid-August, um, as we get closer to the start of the school year, um, we will be reaching out to all parents and caregivers around some, some training that we're going to provide um, for, um, as I said, parents and caregivers as well as students before that first day of school. Um, this will be um, a blend of, of, as we've been talking about, synchronous and asynchronous. We're also using that approach um, as we train parents. So there will be opportunities uh, for parents before the school year starts to log in and get live help learning about Schoology, as well as some um, asynchronous modules that you'll be able to engage with before the school year starts. Um, that training that we're going to provide will be available in English and Spanish um, in early August. So uh, we'll use all our, our normal as well as extended uh, communication channels to get the information out to our community to, uh, to start learning about all the different features that you're gonna, that we are gonna have um, once Schoology is up and running. And in the meantime though, I know this presentation is gonna be shared um, with everybody afterwards. So we wanted to add a few video resources for anybody that wants to go ahead and learn more now before your accounts are active. So in this presentation, we just did link three videos um, where you, after this meeting, if you want to, you can go on and watch those videos and learn some more about, about what's to come. So a lot of information quick there, but I really just wanted to give a brief overview um, as well as then provide in, in um, later in the year or before the school year starts, we'll have that training opportunity for parents to come back and learn more about it. So uh, I think with that, um, I'm going to turn it over next to uh, Marie Gonzalez, our Executive Director of Special Education. Thanks, Ryan. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to share with you tonight a little bit about the virtual learning that we're going to have for special education. The two biggest changes for special education mirror the same two biggest changes that are happening in general education. And those are the addition of the synchronous instruction and the use of the Schoology learning management system. In the spring semester, we provided the majority of our services asynchronously, meaning students could access those services according to the family schedule. When we begin the school year in, uh, in August, on August 20th, in addition to those asynchronous components, we are going to also be providing synchronous components, some synchronous services, meaning that live, real-time, scheduled interaction with teachers and service providers. In addition, we look forward to providing a continuum of services through Schoology. Our services range from inclusion to resource, dyslexia, functional learning, and a wide range of related services. Round Rock ISD is gonna provide training on high quality virtual instruction and specifically the use of Schoology to the whole district. But we are already starting to work with our special education instructional coaches and our support specialists so that they're gonna be in a better position to help our special educators utilize Schoology to individualize for our students. In the spring, we held our ARD meetings via the Zoom platform that seemed to really work well. We do plan to continue holding ARDs through a virtual meeting platform. It's an effective way to limit the physical contact, um, but still being able to achieve all the required components of any given ARD meeting. Special education, is designed to be a service that supplements general education. It doesn't replace it. Special education is for students with disabilities who need something that general education can't provide. By law, it's an individualized plan for the provision of services 
that need to be provided in addition to, not instead of general ed. So when we talk about individualized services, that means the educators who are in the best position to help develop and to implement individualized education plans are the ones who know our students the best. We have a central office team of special ed directors who anxiously look forward to partnering with our campus administrators, with our teachers, and our parents so that together we can plan, problem solve, and tailor services to meet individual student needs. That director team has a lot of knowledge and experience with special education, but the campus team of educators and the parents know each student best. So together, we're gonna to be a very powerful team to support our students as we launch the school year with virtual instruction. Thanks so much. I believe I'm passing the baton on to Student Support Services. Good evening, everyone. I'm Laura Seegers. I'm the Executive Director for State and Federal Programs. And myself and Nancy Guerrero, who you heard from earlier during our presentation, had the honor to collaborate with the leads of the four program areas we'll be discussing tonight to reimagine that while students are engaged in a virtual learning environment in the coming weeks, Student Support Services would also be available for your child's and your family's social and emotional needs. Looking at our counseling program, school counselors will, will act in a way that is very similar to if students were in a brick and mortar school when they're working with virtual students in this environment. They will have the opportunity to meet with large groups, small groups, and even individual sessions to ensure that students, are, students needs are met and they're successful emotionally, socially, and academically. As we move on to SEL, SEL stands for social and emotional learning. And social and emotional learning is, is something that is actually, we're able to integrate. It's the everyday soft skills of relationship building, coping strategies like regulating of emotions and social awareness that helps children to be successful and is an added value to their academic career. If we look at what the particular grades will be receiving individually, students in pre-K through two their lessons will be taught asynchronously. And as we've learned earlier, asynchronously will be not with a teacher support, but there will be live videos, books, things of that sort to help students and parents guide through that lesson, particularly for our youngest learners, and then to be able to apply those skills in their everyday life. In grades three through eight, lessons will be taught and integrated synchronously with teacher support or asynchronously if the discussion and the follow-up. In grades nine through 12, skill building will be integrated into instructional delivery methods, whether they are asynchronous or synchronous. For families and for our community, there'll be weekly mindfulness exercises and a monthly SEL family newsletter will be posted to the Round Rock ISD social media avenues. If we can go to our next slide, please. For mentoring, mentoring will, will happen in a virtual environment very similar to how it also happens in our brick and mortar schools as students were attending in person. In that case, we will have the opportunity for students to have a, a, um, an opportunity to video conference or have a phone call format opportunity to meet with their mentors who have been screened and trained to meet with students and that happens annually. Parents or guardians who have provided advanced permission for this type of mentoring must be home during the virtual mentoring sessions. Parent communication on how to support student mentoring sessions will be provided to parents as well as they engage in the mentoring with their students. I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Amy Grosso, who will speak to us about our mental and behavioral health services. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Um, I'm Amy Grosso, the Director of Behavioral Health Services, as Laura said, and as we've we all know that mental and behavioral health has been an important component for our students um, for a long time, but with what has happened with us being socially isolated, we know it will continue to be a concern and probably will impact even more of our students. And so to be able to help you with that, we will be launching a, a comprehensive mental and behavioral health website that will include um, calendars with all the different activities or webinars that will be housed on that, a lot of resources, and it'll be 
a one-stop shop for mental and behavioral health, social emotional learning, counseling, guides for what resources we have in the community. So really to help you as the families of how to learn about mental and behavioral health and then how to support your students. Um, last year, we started a partnership for our mental health centers with Blue Bonnet Trails that will continue in March of last year. They went to totally televideo, so they are prepared to continue that. And then when it is safe for students to come back to campus and students who are home, they will continue through televideo, but our students coming back, there will be some options for in person. And all those referrals go through the school counselor. So if your child you feel like could be benefit from that, the school counselor assesses and makes those determination and then connects it with Blue Bonnet Trails. The last thing that we started in March and will continue is mental health virtual sessions for parents with partnering with the Council of PTAs. Um, these will be on a variety of different mental health topics, um, even social emotional learning, to help you as the parents at home, first, how you're coping with things going on, and then also how do you support your child in that. So even something from the beginning of the year, we'll do one on how do I help my child adjust to school not being what we've known school. You know, we, we left at the end of May thinking, okay, by August, we'll be back to school and we're not. And so really wanting to provide you with that support that's needed. I'm now gonna pass it over to Jenny who will moderate our Q&A. Thank you so much, Dr. Grosso. We've got a lot of great questions. I've been trying to answer some of them within the Q&A um, as we have been going through. But first of all, and I know this really isn't the focus, this particular question isn't the focus of this town hall, but I think it would be good if uh, Ms. Estes did address it. A lot of folks are, are asking about um, on-campus learning at both the elementary and secondary level. And will that look much different? Will it essentially be virtual while on campus? We're going to be providing a lot more information about what on campus will look like next week at our town halls, both elementary and secondary. We're also um, looking into producing some videos that will give you a look inside the schools. Um, but I, if uh, Ms. Estes, if you'd like to just address it at, at a high level tonight, since we are getting so many questions on that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for the question. We did know, we knew that there'd be a lot of questions about the on-campus experience, so we do have two town halls planned next week, so be sure and join us for those. Um, but to, to answer the question uh, at a high level, yes, schools will look different next year. Um, and it, it's been a challenge for all of us even to wrap our heads around uh, some of the changes that we will have to make for social distancing and safety reasons. Um, we, we love to have th those very nurturing environments and those will continue, but they will physically look different. Students will not be working in very, very close proximity to each other in small groups because we know we need to keep them the social distance of six feet apart. Um, we will not have pillows and soft materials in our classrooms because we need to be able to quickly and easily clean those material or those rooms. Um, school supplies in classrooms will be very individualized. There will be a lot of uh, focus on hand washing. Um, and specifically to virtual, all of our students will learn to use the Schoology platform. We know that's very important because in fact, we're beginning virtually. And then after we do welcome students onto our campus, we're preparing in, in the event that we have school closures down the road so that instruction can continue in a seamless manner. However, in the on-campus environment, you will also experience, your student will have those wonderful face-to-face -face interactions with a caring adult that they, they've grown to expect and that we definitely provide here in Round Rock ISD. So more information to come about that next week, uh, but we will create those nurturing, caring environments that, that we've always had here, but they will look different. Thank you so much. Uh, another popular question has been about what grading will look like for virtual. Um, as, as you all know, in the spring, we did go to pass fail and I've been able to answer that, that we will be going back to traditional grading, but there's also concern about integrity. Um, uh, Ryan, would you like to address that? And I can actually jump in and start that and Ryan can add to it if you want. Um, so we're looking at different options for that. Uh, we recognize that's a concern. That's something that we've been discussing with our teachers. Um, there are some apps out there. There are also some, um, on, there's some online proctoring systems. We've even talked about establishing testing centers within our campuses. So while I can't give you a firm answer on that just yet, um, I, I will tell you that we're looking at a variety of options. 
And Ryan, if you want to add well, anything. I'll just add, I'll just add, I was actually on a uh, email thread today with probably about 30 or 40 other school districts around the, around the state with different um, folks who work in their assessment departments, their teaching learning departments. So we're working together to figure out that very real um, concern that we all have. Um, so I think we'll have more to come on that, but um, just want everybody to know it is, it is something that everybody's working on for a best solution. Another popular um, question, and I think it speaks to how much our families love our teachers. They want to know if um, the teachers teaching their children virtually will be from their home campus. And then sort of a second part to that a question is, if my child is virtual and has a teacher, when she goes back to school, will that be the same teacher? And I think that's coming more from the elementary level. So I'll jump in on that one and then if Carla wants to enhance that from the elementary perspective. We, um, as I mentioned early in this broadcast, we have uh, distributed those commitment sheets and we will use the numbers uh, that we gather from those of the, the students who choose to, to go virtual versus those on campus to build our classes. It is always our desire to keep the student with the teacher that they would have in person or virtual. But to be completely honest, that may not be possible. And so if, if you're thinking that your student may start in the virtual at home environment and you're wanting a guarantee that when they return to school, should they do so in January, um, for example, uh, we'll have to look at class sizes then. We will do the best job that we, that we can, the best that we can to try to keep that teacher aligned. But the reality is that that may not be possible. Um, did, I, did I catch all of that question? I, I think it was a two-parter. Jenny, did I get it all? I think you did. I don't know if Carla wanted to add anything. Yeah. I'll just add a little bit. And the conversation with the elementary principals is really about um, during these first three weeks, um, yes, they'll be assigned, every child will be assigned a teacher, but the teachers will be taking a team approach. And so if I am in um, Ms. Estes' class, I'm also going to be exposed to Ms. Um, you know, Ms. Caputo and Mr. Smith, and I'm going to have some level of familiarity with all the teachers on that team. So if there is some adjustment that needs to be made, it won't be a totally foreign um, teacher to the child. Okay. Uh, another question, um, I know uh, Ryan shared that we've got some videos that we'll be posting those links to for Schoology, um, but they did have a question about will there be sort of practice sessions so parents can try to troubleshoot before uh, the first day of school? Sure, I'll start and then let Dr. Ali um, chime in too. Uh, but uh, we're definitely, we're working with our parenting program team also to develop some of those practice sessions as we get closer to the, to the school year starting. Um, so I'd, I'd say yes, there's gonna be plenty of opportunities. I know Senya has been um, working a lot with looking at ways that we can roll out the information about Schoology. So I don't know if there's anything you wanna add as well. Yeah, we're, we're working on both for parents and our students to be able to navigate Schoology before they uh, start school on August 20th. And we're working on those videos. So it's same as for parents release on, uh, in mid-August, we're gonna do the same thing for our students. So it's student friendly, the videos are student friendly, and especially for our younger kiddos. But it truly is a great LMS. I've just been working in it for the past month. I, I will have a second grader and a middle schooler going to school soon. That's a middle schooler. Um, so just um, having them sort of experience it with me at home has been really, really awesome. Really great tools for them to connect with their teachers. And uh, even though they're virtual, they'll still feel connected back to the campus as much as possible. I know that, uh, Dr. Ali, thanks for that. But I also know that there are teachers, and I know this isn't for teachers tonight, but I can tell you that they want it as well. So it's going to be a learning process for everybody. And so this, you know, j just know that we're all in this together, but uh, that, that's a these are great questions. And I want to thank the thoroughness of the panel. So uh, I'll stop there and, and so that you can ask more questions, Jenny. Uh, I think this would probably be for Ms. Gonzalez. Um, how will progress monitoring of IEP goals be conducted? That's a really great question. And the answer is it's going to depend. It's going to vary depending on what the goals are with what type of knowledge or skill is being measured by that goal. That said, we are gonna be able to gather data through the learning management system. We're also gonna look for progress evidenced during student-teacher interactions, during synchronous instruction, that live real-time communication between students and teachers, and a little bit the old-fashioned way through assignments and assessments as well. So it's, gonna, it's really gonna depend on what the goal is. How we measure it will vary depending on that. 
and stick in with you, Marie, while you're unmuted. <laughs> um, when will evaluations for support services reconvene? That is a really great question. Um, we did start in-person evaluations last week. We were very excited. I think we were off to a great start. And then unfortunately, due to the increase in COVID cases in our area, we did have to suspend those uh, again. We are working with the service center. We're asking TEA for guidance on what other options we might have. But um, please know that we are anxious to get those evaluations back underway. We want to identify students who need our services. Um, we take our child find responsibilities incredibly seriously. Unfortunately, I don't have a real finite answer to that. I don't have an exact date, but we're sitting on the edge of our seat and we are anxiously pursuing the answer to that question. Thank you. Um, this is a, a question uh, really voicing some concern about the K through, two, K through second daily schedule. Um, a concern about too much screen time for this age group. Um, this particular poster had a kindergarten student last year who really struggled to stay focused on a screen for more than 30 minutes at a time. Some of our curriculum experts want to jump in and talk about that concern. Sure, and I think that's the very reason that um, when TEA came out with their guidance, they did not provide a uh, attendance accounting method that required a certain number of hours of synchronous instruction for pre-K through second grade students. And so I would say, um, please keep in mind that the, the schedules that were shared tonight are sample schedules. Uh, we know that those will need to be adapted by the classroom needs, by the, by the student needs that are participating in the virtual environment. Um, and so whenever you put out a schedule that is um, ranging in grade levels, uh, we're, we're targeting the middle ground. We're really just trying to give you an idea of the mix and the blend of live interactions and asynchronous work. And, and that said, even if the individual teacher schedule um, for your child's teacher um, varies from that and still doesn't work, that's one of those moments, as you remember from the beginning of this, that I encourage parents to stay in close communication with their teachers. We wanna work with you and to design an educational experience that works for your child. And Mandy, you anticipated another question, which was, are those uh, schedules set in stone or, or could they be modified? So thank you for, for answering that as well. And I'd also like to encourage um, any of the panelists, if you wanna look in the Q&A and if you see something you can answer, you can actually type an answer um, or uh, jump in and, and provide it. And, and just for those watching, I know we're nearing 6.30, but since we did have a lengthy presentation, but I hope, I hope its thoroughness was, was a, a value to you and that will be posted as well. But we will go, um, for our panelists are game for it, we'll, we'll go till 6.45 to make sure we can have a good amount of time to get to your, to your questions. Uh, another question, would an iPad be sufficient, a sufficient device for the youngest kids, second graders and, and younger, or do they really need a laptop? And iPad. I'll take, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, Ryan. You can extend, but yeah. I would say, especially for our youngest learners, an iPad would be an appropriate, um, appropriate device if, for any anybody who's interacting. And our youngest learners won't be interacting probably with Schoology as much as our older learners. But it's it's um, you know web based and there's apps for it. But as far as what the the learning is actually going to look like for our youngest learners, I'd say an iPad is a very appropriate device. Another um, kind of philosophical question that I know you guys like to tackle. What mode of instruction, synchronous or asynchronous or versus asynchronous, is most comprehensive for multi-sensory teaching? Well, that is a good question. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I, I would answer that asynchronous is for most students. Um, you know, it, it's, it's going to somewhat depend upon uh, uh, the child's ability to focus for periods of time, but when you when you think about a student who learns tactily um, or a student who um, maybe is more of an auditory learner, um, those things by virtue of, of how they learn might not lend themselves to as much screen time. And so that asynchronous portion, uh, allowing the child to get outside and turn over rocks and get a magnifying glass and, and study the insects that are under the rocks, those are gonna be hugely important um, to students um, who, who best learn that way. I had a question about um, uh, dyslexia intervention programs. How will the district ensure fidelity with uh, those programs in this environment? Thanks for that question. We currently have two staff trainers, two trainers on staff. One is uh, our trainer for the Wilson Reading Program, and one is for the Wilson Just Words. And those two folks have already begun formal professional development on Schoology to determine 
if that's going to be the best platform for providing dyslexia instruction. Um, we anticipate that learning management system will support dyslexia services. And once we get our feet wet with it and no more, if that's not going to work, then we will explore other options. And Marie, can you um, maybe give an overview too? We got several questions, just people wondering how can virtual learning really accommodate a special needs of, of your of students with IEPs? Can you maybe just kind of give an overview of that? Sure, and it, that's gonna really range widely depending on the level of need of the student. Some of our students need a few accommodations and have some, some goals for really accessing general ed curriculum throughout their whole school day. We have that all the way through students who need an alternate curriculum provided that they have um, some pretty significant cognitive or developmental disabilities that may re require us to replace the curriculum, really drill down to the essence of our Texas essential knowledge and skills. So it's going to look different for different kids when it's more like providing accommodations and some conclusion support. We're looking at ways for our special education teachers to partner with our general education teachers in Schoology, perhaps a co-teach model, even in that virtual environment. And then for students who need modified curriculum, we have special ed teachers who will have their own Schoology class sections. They'll be really looking at uh, meeting individualized education plan needs through the modified curriculum in a resource setting. For our kiddos who may need more like functional learning, um, we always value our partnership with parents, all of our parents, but we will especially need to partner with parents of students who are most impacted by a cognitive or developmental disability. We will need your help, as we did in the spring, to have your child follow a schedule, especially now that we're going to be providing these synchronous components as part of their day. So you don't have students sitting in front of a screen for, for stretches longer than is are really developmentally appropriate for them. So we're going to work on individual schedules for our students and then we're going to look on a, a lot of direct teach on how to do that. So we are going to partner with our parents. I want to echo something that Ms. Estes said at the beginning. We're not expecting our parents to be the teachers, but we will need their help in making sure that we teach our kiddos how to, how to access the synchronous and asynchronous virtual learning. Thank you. Um, this next question, I think we'll, we'll be going more into detail on this when we um, have our middle and high school general overview, but, but we're getting it a lot. So I do want to ask for students who choose virtual, but will, um, you know, want to participate in extracurricular activities or, or maybe um, JROTC, will there be an opportunity for them to be at the school when they need to be at school for those things, but, but still be virtual? Yes, and we'll go more into detail on that next week, as Jenny said, but we are working on options that would allow for a student to come to the campus for um, select classes, not every class. We don't want the kids back and forth all day, but for those specialized classes, we are absolutely working on that. And in addition, as you know, parents, there are many after school and before school activities, and your child would be uh, completely welcome to participate in those as well, um, to the degree that you, you believe it is safe for your child to do so. Let me interject as well, Mandy. I think that's a great question, and I know that I get a lot of emails, especially right now. Uh, after yesterday, the UIL did allow for a calendar to be released that uh, we're still interpreting, and, and we will, I think, uh, we're close to finalizing what that means for us. But for parents that are watching, I'd just like to say that we're going to be as flexible as possible and try to get back to some normalcy and extracurriculars and activities are also uh, an opportunity for that normalcy to occur as soon as possible, but yet be as safe as possible. So our coaches and our uh, directors and band directors and all are working uh, nonstop to try to make that happen. But no doubt that uh, they will be allowed uh, to participate and, and we'll try as hard as possible that we can uh, allow for that to happen so that they can have some success. Again, it's going to be about flexibility uh, more so than ever. So thanks for that question. Along the lines of flexibility, um, this parent's also wondering if uh, in the virtual world, have we considered sort of a block scheduling, whether you group online learning either in the morning or the afternoon. Um, and and the, the reasoning is that it would be uh, more disruptive to have stu students log in for 30 minute sessions with an hour in between them and could make a, present a challenge for parents with childcare issues. Well, not knowing the grade level that we're, we're speaking of, for the secondary students for middle through high school, those breaks in between 
um, are very needed. One, for high school students to be able to come to the campus during that time should they need to do so. Um, and and I, think we, I think we are reluctant to put a child on a screen for long periods of time and then long periods of time of independent study. But again, as I said earlier, and as Dr. Flores just said, we know that flexibility is key. Um, and so once your child begins on this program, if you choose for your child to learn at home, please do reach out to the teacher, communicate with the teacher, and, and we will definitely make those adjustments that, that need to be made to the, to the best of our ability. If I could just interject, um, when you see or hear asynchronous learning, and, and that's a, a practice time to practice the skills that have been taught, that doesn't necessarily mean screen time. Um, so asynchronous learning, um, you know, could be that they're asked to spend some time engaging in a writing exercise, like real writing with your hands, right? So, um, or it might be that they're, you know, supposed to be doing something um, hands-on outside in their environment for science. So um, the asynchronous time is, here is what we need you to get done. Um, you learn about it, you know, from the delivery on the computer briefly, but it does not necessarily mean screen time. So like in the elementary model, the, the screen time is the two hours face-to-face, -face, one hour with the whole class, one hour small group. And our teachers are masters of modifying um, and adjusting and monitoring kids and knowing if they need to cut something short because it's not working. We do that in classrooms every day. And so it would be the same in this environment. So teachers will be responsive to kids' needs. Um, but please know that when you see asynchronous learning on a schedule, it doesn't necessarily mean screen time. Thank you, Carla. Um, we ha are also receiving several questions on school supplies, and I can tell you that um, um, several of us were discussing this this morning. And, and you know, what does that look like? Do you take the list, uh, the normal campus list, if you're going to be doing virtual, and go go buy all the red and yellow folders and three inch binders? And what type of supplies should you be looking looking at? And I will say we're going to be putting some more information out about that to all of our parents because we know that's a that's a concern. Yes, we, we are, and, and uh, the school supplies may look a little bit different. We do have a group that is going to work on putting out lists specifically for our virtual learners. Um, another thing that we are exploring is we realize that there are some instructional resources, especially in the pre-K, kinder, first grade, um, grade levels that may be available to the teacher in the classroom, but that parents might not typically have at home. And so we started to explore what we could replicate um, regarding providing some instructional materials such as man manipulatives, perhaps magnetic letters that we could send home to our virtual learners. So more to come on that, but we are in discussions about uh, what those supply needs might be for a virtual learner. This next one's a question about a concern for students who may have fallen behind, um, you know, with, with the events that were happening over the spring. Will there be any type of assessment so we can kind of see where kids are when they, when they arrive, virtually or in person? Yeah, I'll take that one at a high level and then uh, Mr. Smith might want to add on because he has a, a team that's working on that. But uh, we are uh, looking at some assessments each, each year when students come to us, we do um, screeners um, to see where they are, um, what progress has been made or lost over the summer. And so this will be no different. Um, it will be, of course, different in that it's in a virtual environment. Um, another thing that parents might want to know is that we are reincorporating much of the curriculum from the spring, even a little bit before um, we went on our extended break our COVID break, uh, just to make sure that content that was covered during that time, much of which was review based on where we were at that point in the year, um, is uh, reviewed again and incorporated into this year's curriculum. Um, and Ryan, did you have anything to add on the, the assessment piece? I, I think all I'll add is that, uh, you know, our teachers are, are you know, anxious about that question as well. Um, you know, we've been working with them to as, as Ms. Estes mentioned, you know, take a lot of the concepts that, that were taught in the spring and cycle those back into this coming school year. Um, but I, I just want to, to let everybody know too that while we are, you know, looking to assess and screen, um, screen's kind of a, a technical term, but really look at our, our students and where they are compared to where we think they might be, you know, and then determine how we're gonna best utilize our, our resources of interventionists of working with our classroom teachers and parents to better meet those needs of students who, who we can see, you know, might need a little extra help as we as we start this coming school year. That 
we're also we also recognize that during the first couple of weeks there's going to be a lot of of getting used to being in school getting used to being in this environment getting used to being when we do get to that point where there's some students back um face to face that that we're, we're also mindful of the need to to assess and know where we are but also mindful that we need to welcome everybody back and get everybody back in the in the in the swing of things so i think it's a blend that we're gonna we're gonna work through uh, but as a as Mandy said, you know, we definitely have teams looking at that and how we can how we can best do it. Thanks, Ryan. We're getting lots of questions and I've uh, answered some directly via the Q&A, um, but we're still getting them about, you know, when do we have to make this decision? How long is it for if we say virtual, are we committed? Um, and of course, you know, we know that, that we are asking for a commitment for a grading period um, by August 6th. However, if someone's in person and their circumstances change that virtual uh, might might be healthier, a safer choice for them. Um, you know, we do talk about flexibility. So Mandy, Dr. Flores, you want to talk a little bit about how we're approaching that? Yeah, absolutely. Because we know in this environment that family situations may change. Um, we, we, we all had a, a situation that changed last March um, for all of us. And so we're very mindful of that. Uh, it's best practice to leave that instructional environment constant if that's possible. Um, and so we're, we, we would hope that families will be able to at least wait until that grading period to make a change. But we also recognize if there's a job change and a parent who maybe was previously able to stay home during the day is now starting a new job and will no longer be able to be there to support their at-home learner, we, we, of course, will be flexible and, and welcome that child into our school with open arms. Similarly, we may have some students who, during the course of the year, um, become exposed to COVID uh, or um, even contracted or another illness, and having the virtual platform available would allow them to leave an on-campus environment and to work uh, as a virtual learner at home. So uh, it, yes, flexibility is key. Um, we want to work with our families on that. We also want to, to strive to keep the learning environment constant. Dr. Gross, so here's one for you. We're, we've actually gotten several people just voicing concerns and then asking questions about how do we support the social aspect, the engagement that's critical to learning success. And, and of course, we're all concerned about the emotional well-being of our, of our students as well. No, it's a great question. And I think um, our whole nation is trying to figure this out and what, what is it going to look like? And a lot of people have talked about like what are lasting impacts. And I think the biggest thing for parents too is being open to a level that's developmentally appropriate, but also being willing to say it is different and it is hard and being able to allow your child to fill that and to work through it. And I know they're like hearing a lot, I, I have a six year old, like too much screen time and stuff. And it is a balance, right? But I know that screen time for him when he gets to interact with classmates is critical for his social well being. And so there is a balance. And I think for parents, that's where the website will come in really handy that we're developing. And also the sessions I, I'll be doing with PTA and we'll bring in some other people. So we'll give you specific tools of how to have those conversations with your child what you can say, what you can do. It's like last year we did one on seniors grieving their senior year because it looked different. So I think we'll continue to do a lot of that to give you those tools that you've not had to have before. Um, none of us have. I think the reality is we are living through something we've never lived before and we have to continue to remind ourselves that and that it, 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 it can't look like what we're used to school looking like and um, to be okay with, um, sitting with some of those emotions that we don't really like to sit with. Right, thank you. We're gonna squeeze in a couple more. Um, Marie, this one's back in your world. Um, will special education services be live and synchronous during virtual instruction? And um, some examples they asked about were speech, occupational therapy, physical therapy, social skills. Like the other types of just special education services, it's going to be undoubtedly a combination. There's going to be some synchronous live interaction and some asynchronous here. Let's apply what you've learned. You know, let's, let's practice those, those pieces. Um, I do want to tout the fact that we are doing a pilot of a speech tele a teletherapy program this summer. It's the Amplio speech program. It's the one that TEA has promoted. And um, so we're piloting it this summer to sort of learn the ins and outs of it and determine if that's the platform we want to go forward with 
or if we want to use Schoology, I know that there are options for all of our related services through Schoology. But the short answer is yes, it's going to be a combination of, of asynchronous and synchronous. Okay. Uh, Mandy, maybe for you or Carla, this is a question about will the lessons and assignments be created by uh, your child's own teacher or were these created at the district level? Um, so all second grade lessons look the same. Which way are we going with that? The teacher. The teacher and the, and the team of teachers, they usually work collaboratively to develop those lessons, uh, will be the ones that are, that are designing the lessons. Okay. Just looking for one to end on. <laughs> oh, there was an interesting, some, some very um, careful reader noticed that the, uh, the middle school schedule looked just like the high school in terms of block scheduling. We're gonna talk a little bit about how you know, the question was, are we going to block scheduling now at middle school? So um, in relation to um, screen time, um, we spent a lot of time, 11 principals really, um, with teaching and learning, um, really dialoguing about what screen time would look like if we went through our traditional schedule of seven to eight periods. And we didn't want our adolescents, um, our students in the middle, to be jumping off and on the screen 30 minutes um, and then jumping off for 20 and then 30 once again. So it is not at all the middle, the high school schedule where students are broken into 90 period days in a normal setting. We are, that's why we've condensed it. Um, and so we've allowed for no more than four, than two hours for 30 minute sessions each day. So we're gonna go period one through four with 30 minutes for each class period where they have FaceTime, a live interaction with their teacher, and then more flexible asynchronous that looks different. I'm working independently, I'm working um, with a small group, so it varies, but it, the idea was to really meet students' needs, their social emotional needs, so they weren't getting, um, too much time on that screen. So we are still going to receive that schedule that has eight periods, seven academic and elective courses and an advisory. Um, and then, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna piggyback it four classes every other day. So just to help students balance. And if I can um, interject as well, and thank you, Dr. Guerrero. Um, I want to remind everyone that even within our, our classrooms, that instructional time will vary, the direct instruction time that a teacher is teaching uh, given the lesson. So for some lessons, that's a very quick 15 minute um, instructional opportunity, a little bit of guided practice, and the teacher sends the kids off to work either independently or in groups. Other lessons, uh, maybe perhaps science lab demonstrations and so forth, might take a longer period of time. And so keep in mind, these are sample schedules. And even at high school and middle school, I suspect those synchronous times are gonna vary based upon what the learning content is for that given day. Dr. Flores, any final thoughts for our viewers? Yeah, just, uh, I wanna thank them for joining us. And I know that this is informative for me as superintendent to hear this panel because it reassures me that our district is, we don't have all the answers. And I wish I could say we do, but we don't. No one in the world does right now. So in these times of uncertainty, I just want us to know that we're working very hard on behalf of your child. And for that, we want you to just feel comfortable that guess what, we're gonna get through this together because the world will be better soon. I firmly believe that. And I also, I know that a lot of the questions that I, or a lot of emails that I've received are about the fact that please, please don't go virtual. Don't do this, get us back in school. I get that. As soon as I make one decision, I make 50% of the other group uh, unhappy. But know that what we do are making decisions, we're making decisions, the board and I and others that are saying what's in the best interest for the long run. And here's what I will say, and I'll end with this. And I hope that tonight, a lot of the questions I've received have been, are we gonna go back to the way we learned in March? Let, let me just say that in March, that was called crisis education, crisis. In other words, we, and even I thought, we were gonna get back as soon as possible. We were getting daily, weekly reports, and then guess what? Finally, they said, no, we can't come back. So we did not come back last spring. That was crisis education. I want everybody, and I want everybody to be rest assured that we will continue what we know in Round Rock we're known for rigor in our curriculum, 
We're also known for the relationships that our teachers provide in each and every classroom. That's not going away. So when we work together, we're better. And I know that we're tonight, there's several answers we didn't get to, but please be patient with us and we will be patient with you. And together, this district, this district, Round Rock ISD will still be that destination district. I hear a lot of folks saying, hey, I've got to make a decision, got to make a decision. I hope tonight you give us the opportunity to prove that we can and will be the same Round Rock ISD with regards to the quality of excellence you can expect from us each and every day. I'm more convinced because of the panel I just saw. That's our panel, that's our family, and you're part of that as well. So with that, thanks, Jenny, for allowing me to close. I, that's totally off the cuff, but. <laughs> you did good, sir. But I wanna thank you, and I wanna thank all of our panelists. I wanna thank Pam and Heather for helping interpret it for us. We really appreciate that. Um, and we do have two more town halls coming up, and we'll, we'll do more as necessary on more specific uh, topics. Uh, Tuesday night is focusing on elementary and what that on-campus instruction looks like Thursday on middle and high school. So we hope you join us. And this will be posted, This uh, the presentation and the video will be posted on our Reimagining Education webpage uh, by tomorrow. And there's a big link right at the top of our homepage. We'll also share it on our social media channels. So stay tuned and, and follow us for the latest information. Thanks everyone.